as we know the Prophet peace and blessings of Allah be upon him described Ramadan with three unique qualities and he said that the beginning of it is mercy and the, end, the middle of it is forgiveness and the end of it is freedom from the fire and so as we end the as we approach the end of Ramadan the meaning that should perhaps be most present before us the, the goal that should be most immediate before us the grand prize as it were of Ramadan that we should all be after is liberation from the torment of the hellfire we hope and pray and beg Allah that he grant us that Ya Rabbil Alameen and that despite our shortcomings despite our bad manners despite our heedlessness that because of his grace his sublimity his kindness that he gaze upon us and the rest of the ummah and write for us freedom from the hellfire Ya Rabbil Alameen and we know that Allah created a world of means He created a world in which He makes ways for things to come about like He created a, He made the door so you can come into the house so to speak He created means for things to happen He is the ultimate uncaused cause of all things but He created a world in which if you want something to happen you do something to get that thing to happen and fasting Ramadan and standing at night and giving charity and all of these things that we've been blessed to do of devotional activities is one of the ways that we do that but a reminder for us as we begin to wrap up Ramadan about some things that we can do throughout the rest of Ramadan to hopefully save ourselves from the torment of the fire there's a hadith where the prophet peace and blessings of Allah be upon him is reported to have said man masha fi hajati akhihi kana khayrun lahu min i'tikafi ashri sinin wa man i'takafa yawman ibtigha'a wajhi lahi ja'alallahu baynahu wa bayna nari thalath khanadiq كل خندق أبعد مما بين الخافقين أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم. It's a fast. Everything the Prophet said was fascinating, but this is a fascinating thing that the Prophet is reported to have said: that whoever goes to fulfill the need of their brother, and we understand by language that this includes their sister. The Arabic language defaults to the masculine, like many other languages do. But it doesn't obviously suggest that it's gender specific. So as I translate the rest of the hadith, we'll just say it with the masculine default. Whoever goes to fulfill the need of their brother, it's better than making i'tikaf, than engaging in spiritual retreat for 10 years. Men masha fi hajati akhi, who just goes to fulfill the need of their brother or their sister. It's better than spending 10 years in i'tikaf. And whoever spends one day in i'tikaf, sincerely for the sake of God, God will place between them and the hellfire three trenches. Each of them is further than that which is between the heavens and the earth, or the east and the west, if you will. Look how beautiful, <laughs> look how beautiful Allah is. It's almost like you only don't get forgiven if you really, really don't want to be forgiven. It's almost like only if you refuse forgiveness will you not be forgiven. Whoever fasts for Ramadan will be forgiven their past sins. Believing in Allah, anticipating a reward will be forgiven their past sins. Whoever stands at night on Ramadan will be forgiven their past sins. Whoever gives someone to break their fast will be forgiven. Whoever stands on the night of power, believing in Allah, anticipating a reward will be forgiven their past sins. And he says, whoever makes the i'tikaf for one day sincerely for the sake of Allah, he'll, in, it's hyperbole, right? When he says that he puts three spaces between him and the hellfire, each of them further than the heavens and the earth, it's hyperbole. Meaning that he doesn't even get anywhere near hellfire. If he does his i'tikaf sincerely for the sake of Allah. But at the beginning he says what? 
to go fulfill the need of your brother or sister is better than making your itikaf for 10 years. So the good news is, as Ramadan wraps up, is back to life, back to reality. It's time to get to work. It's time to look at if whether the spiritual energy that we got in Ramadan is going to fuel anything meaningful in the world. Are we going to be people who fulfill the needs of those around us immediately? And then by extension, anywhere people may have a need. And one of the fascinating things about our Prophet Wasallam is that he always made room for whatever lane you're going to be in. In other words, if you're someone who is able to do a lot of devotional work, Alhamdulillah, you have the devotional side. And you get to be rewarded for doing that. But many of us, especially the outside of Ramadan, are extremely busy. Extremely busy. But when the brother or the sister need help, all of the sudden, we become even more busy. Qari Umar, hafidhuhullah, may Allah reward him abundantly and bless him and protect him and give him good health and bless his family. To think that a man who just spent the last 27 days leading us in prayer, the first thing he says when he's done is pray for the volunteers. If I was him, I'd say pray for me. Right? Pray for me. But he says pray for the volunteers. What happens when we need help in the community? Say, brother, there's a, an event, we need help. And alhamdulillah, a community like this, the volunteers are very generous. But sometimes, when it comes time to, to help, we get even extra busy. I remember one time a brother who was active in the community outside of the Bay Area, he complained and he said, every time I call the brothers and say that we, we, have, we need help, we need help with the masjid, nobody shows up. I say, come at 7 or 8 o'clock, we need to help so-and-so do such and such. Nobody shows up. He said, so one day I wanted to trick them. And I told them, we have a meeting at the masjid at 7 o'clock for dinner. And all of them came. <laughs> but there was no dinner. So they came and said, MashaAllah, Jazakallah khair, where's dinner? He said, there's no dinner. <laughs> I just wanted to show you where our hearts are at. That's why Imam al-Haddad, rahimahullah, said, if you find it hard to go to the masjid for fajr, but then someone told you tomorrow there'll be a wealthy person at the masjid distributing wealth, giving out gifts, and you showed up to Fajr, you know how sincere you really are. May Allah give us sincerity. My father one time, who's a Christian, he said to me, son, do you think you could ask a few of the brothers at the masjid to help me move? I said, inshallah. I said, probably, hopefully. But in my mind I thought, what? Inshallah. So I called a couple of brothers, brother Akhi, my dad's moving, can you help me? Oh, I'm work, right? Wife, kids, I'm busy. And I started to think, subhanAllah, I can't find anybody. But then luckily I found one or two brothers who was willing to help. So I called my dad, I said, Pops, alhamdulillah, good news. I have brothers helping. He said, no, no, don't worry. He said, the people at church found out that I was moving and they have a moving committee. A moving committee. <laughs> that's there all the time. <laughs> Whenever anyone in the community is getting ready to move, you just let us know and we're ready to help. So in our community, we have some room for improvement when it comes to willingness to help one another, however big or however small. But even deeper than that is to do a gut check about how we think about these advices of our beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Salawatu Rabbi wa salamu alayhi wa ala alayhi. He says to go help your brother, and I automatically think of Brother Zaid at the masjid, or Brother Amr at the masjid. Hypothetical Zaid or Amr, huh? I say, oh, alhamdulillah, this hadith. Next time Asif Bai forces me to give a talk, even though I came just to pray, alhamdulillah, inshallah, the hadith applies. But more important even than that is for us to remember that our parents, our spouses, our siblings, our children, they're included in the idea of someone being your brother. Our families are Muslim, alhamdulillah. And it will apply, inshallah, even if our families are not Muslim, our families are Muslim. So when the Prophet says, Man mesha fi hajati akhi, whoever goes to help his brother, it applies to our families as well. So to think, when your wife makes that ridiculous request, 
that absurd request, that insane request for you to stop on the way home and pick something up at the grocery store, right? Do you think you can stop on the way home and get some milk? Ah, long day at work, right? I don't have time for this. I need to get home. Watch the game. Remember the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in Mesha fi hajati akhi. And it applies, inshallah. When your husband makes that ridiculous request of kindly preparing a salt bath for his feet or whatever when he gets home because <laughs> he had a long day at work, she doesn't say, I'm busy with the kids. She says, inshallah. Man mesha fi hajati akhi. And what did the Prophet say sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Allahu fi al abdi ma kan al abdu fi uni akhihi o kama qala sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wasallam Allah will continue to help a servant as long as that servant is helping their brother or helping their sister so we say how does a child help their parent how does a child help their parent a child helps their parent by remembering that the frame of reference and the experience that their parent is drawing from is very different than the frame of reference in the experience that you have. So you're patient with your parent. Be a little more thick-skinned. Don't be so reactionary. Don't flip out every time your parent asks you to do something. or Don't flip out every time your parent doesn't understand. They just don't understand. Maybe they don't just understand, but even if they don't, be a little more thick-skinned, be a little bit more patient. Try to be more understanding. Try to be more merciful. How does the parent help the child in addition to all the ways that the parent is helping the child already? Help the child by remembering that the frame of reference that your child and the experience that your child is drawing from is so different than the one that you're drawing from. Somebody came up to me the other day, they said, the reason we need young people like you in our community is because you speak the lingo of the youth. And Ali John can relate to the fact that I asked myself, do I really? Because even me, I don't, speak, I don't know. I was with a young person in our community a few weeks ago. They said, are you going to be at such and such place at such and such time? I said, I'm not really sure. She said to me, okay, JW. I said, JW, what does that mean? She said, just wondering. <laughs> I said, J.W. Marriott. I thought you were about the J.W. Marriott. J.W. Different language, different experience, even in a few years. So if I'm out of touch, subhanAllah. So to be patient, one of the salaf, Allah be well pleased with them, said, I, I never ask my son, and don't get any ideas here, but this is just to speak in hyperbole, that I never asked my son to do anything for me for 30 years because I was afraid that he might disobey me. I was afraid that he might say no and then get in trouble. It doesn't mean we're not going to ask our children to help us, but it means what to help your child by remembering that they're drawing from a different experience. And we have to remember that our Prophet was the best example when it came to accessibility. And I'll leave you with one story because it's a story that is moving. When your beloved was in the marketplace and he went to buy something for himself and he only had a few coins, he didn't have very much money. And he came and saw this young slave girl in the, in the marketplace weeping. And he said to her, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Maliki Yahadihi. What's wrong, miss? What's wrong? When the Arabs say Ya Hadha or Ya Hadihi, it's either kind of an affront or to speak in an endearing way. If you say Ya Hadha, it's either saying like, hey, hey, or it's like saying, hey. So he says, Maliki Ya Hadihi. What's wrong, miss? And she says, O Messenger of Allah, the, the ladies who own me, they sent me to the marketplace to buy something and I spent the money. So what happens? Does he give her a khutbah? Inna alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu. What does he do, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam? He gives her the little bit of money that he had left for himself. And he says, here you go. So she goes on her way 
and he goes on his way. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And he comes back a little while later and he finds that she's still sitting there and she's still crying. So he says, what's wrong? Did I give you the money? Did it? And she says, Ya Rasulullah, I bought the thing that I was told to buy, but now I'm late. And I'm afraid that when I go home, I'm going to get punished for being late. And she said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, would you do me a favor? And he said, Hubban wa karam. I would be honored to. What do we say? It depends on what it is. <laughs> huh? That's why you, you have to, right? Before you say yes, you say what? It depends on what it is. He said, I'd be honored to. And she said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, would you walk me home? And so the Prophet of Allah, a leader of a community, and a father to children, and a husband to his family, Salawatul took time to walk this young lady halfway across town. They said she lived in the furthest part of Al Medina. And when they came to the door of the house, the Prophet said, Assalamu alaikum. And nobody responded. So he said again, Assalamu alaikum. And nobody responded. And then he said a third time, Assalamu alaikum. And then they said, Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So the Prophet came and he said, why? why didn't you respond the first two times I said salam? They said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, we knew that if somebody, if you greeted somebody and they didn't respond, and you, that you would just keep saying salam, and we wanted you to just keep saying salam to us. So then what did he do? He said, this young lady asked me to come with her. I'm paraphrasing obviously for time's sake. He said, this young lady asked me to come with her, and she's worried because she's late. And they said, O Messenger of Allah, since you brought her, he li wajhillah. She's free. She's free. And they freed her. This is how the Prophet was, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How could you be the one who says, Tanamu aini wa la yinamu qalbi. My eye sleeps, but my heart never sleeps. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How can you be the one who remembered Allah in every situation. How could you be the one in him yardabli nafsihi qabd? He never got angry for himself. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How could you be the one? Ma qala la qattu illa fi tashahudihi. Law la tashahudu kanat la'uhu na'amu. How could you be the one that never said no? As it Farazdaq describes him in praising his great grandson Sayyidina Ali Zayn al Abidin ibn al Hussein. Radiallahu anna majma'in ma qala la qattu illa fi tashahudihi law la tashahadu kanat la'uhu na'amu He never said no except when he said there's no God but Allah and if it wasn't for that testimony his no would have been a yes sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam One of the sahaba as we close one time they saw the messenger of Allah wearing a a burda, a mantle like a cloak and they said that he looked exceptionally handsome in it. And he was always exceptionally handsome. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. I see some of the mouths not moving. It's like you didn't hear the name of the Habib. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. I know it's late, but it's never too late for Sayyidina Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They saw the Prophet wearing this burda and it had a, a reddish tone to it. And one of the Sahaba came and he said, Ya Rasulullah, can I have that? Can you can I have your coat? Imagine, be careful on the way out, somebody, because you heard what he said. He said, Ya, ya Rasulullah, can I have your jacket? Can I have your cloak? And he said, No, nah, of course, yes. And he gave the Sahabi to wear the cloak. But then the companions were bothered by that. They didn't like the fact that he took the Prophet's cloak. So they came and they said, Why did you take it? The Prophet looked exceptionally beautiful in it. And he said, I only took it because I know he would never be asked something and, he, and say, no. And I didn't want it for myself, but I wanted it so they could bury me in it. So I could be buried in something that touched the body of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How could you be all of those things 
and then still be in the menial service of the people in your community. Still be the one, it was narrated about him, that never did one of his family members or his community or a young person or an old person in his community call him except that he responded by saying, Labbaik, here I am at your service. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. So we pray that Allah will make us service-minded people. Now some of you may say that doesn't sound spiritual enough. That doesn't sound Ramadani enough. But it's actually at the core of Ramadan. For those of you who came late, he said, whoever goes to fulfill the need of his brother is better than being in i'tikaf for 10 years. And whoever spends one day in i'tikaf, sincerely for the sake of Allah, Allah will put three trenches between him and the hellfire, each of them further than that which is between the heavens and the earth. May Allah free us from the fire, Ya Rabbil Alameen. And may Allah continue to bless this community, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Bless this masjid, and bless the people who care for it, and bless the people who spend them, and bless this young man who's knocking over the microphone. And <laughs>